Good morning and welcome to the Bloomberg Live event, Disruption, the New Economic Driver. I'm Carol Masser, host of Bloomberg Business Week on Bloomberg Radio and Bloomberg TV. Today we're going to hear from leaders and talk about how they are and should be navigating and embracing disruption. The challenges brought about by the pandemic have highlighted now more than ever the need for businesses to be continually nimble and prepared for change. Each of our speakers represents a different sector of business, and they'll be sharing their approaches to how they lead their companies during moments of change. We'll be asking a number of key questions as we really seek to better understand how a mindset of self-disruption and innovation can be a driver for future economic success. Now, before we get started, just a few housekeeping announcements. First of all, I would like to acknowledge our sponsor. Alex Partners. I'd also like to welcome our global community who are tuning in, including the thousands of listeners on social media and also those on the Bloomberg Terminal. Do please make sure you're using Firefox or Chrome. Refresh your browser if you're having any issues with sound, and you can restore windows using the but buttons at the bottom of your screen. Now, the size of each window, it is adjustable. You can also join the conversation via social media, and we would love to hear from you. Encourage you to follow us on LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook using the handle at Bloomberg Live or at business. So let's start our program. And before we get to our CEO panel, here to kick it all off is Simon Freakley. He is the CEO of Alex Partners. Over to you, Simon. Good afternoon, everybody. Firstly, I'd like to thank Bloomberg's Carol Massa and our panelists for making this event happen. With the pandemic causing a global reset, this conversation is critically important in understanding the forces that are driving the world economy today and how to respond so that we have the opportunity to succeed tomorrow. The COVID-19 crisis has laid bare the central economic reality of our times. Disruption is the new economic driver. Cycles of disruption have effectively replaced credit cycles as the primary driver of the global economy and business. Business leaders are grappling with multiple concurrent forces that are upending how they do business, and disruption is what keeps them awake at night. Alex Partners surveyed more than 3,000 senior executives around the world for our 2021 Disruption Index. What we found is that the cycles of disruption have emerged as the central strategic challenge for business leaders today. Global executives say that managing the forces of disruption is their greatest strategic challenge. And these forces range from technological advances to shifts in consumer behaviors to a changing regulatory environment. But surprisingly, COVID-19 wasn't the top concern for most businesses. New and evolving competition, artificial intelligence, increasing regulation were all viewed by executives as a greater challenge than COVID. This underscores how pervasive and dynamic the forces of disruption are. Business models and strategies which have proven themselves successful over many years are fast becoming obsolete. Though COVID-19 may not come top of the list of disruptions, its impact on the way we do business is obviously profound and lasting. Take this virtual event, for example. In our survey, global executives said that the pandemic has permanently altered aspects of how they'll do business, especially in their interactions with employees and customers. What's the best way to respond to disruption? Be proactive and act now. Our survey found that executives who are alert to the forces of disruption on their business and have actively addressed them, view their companies as being in a better position now than they were a year ago. Successful companies respond to disruption by accelerating the transformation of their businesses and being rigorous in the execution of their strategies. They build the right structures and culture to enable effective coordination and communication while keeping agility. They disrupt and reinvent themselves before others do it to them. At Alex Partners, we recommend to our client CEOs that they do the following. First, Focus on a few priorities that really matter. 
make the hard choices and then drive and measure progress on these few essential priorities. Secondly, execute, execute, execute. Disruption is here to stay, so you need to respond with a relentless focus on execution. And thirdly, over-communicate your vision. A clear and compelling vision of the future is only valuable if it's shared with others. Leadership means inspiring and motivating others to quickly take the bold steps to build a stronger and more sustainable future. As we often say to our CEO clients, be your own chief communication officer. The stakes have never been higher. In a volatile environment, clarity, control and pace are a necessity. The economic and competitive environment may not be in anyone's control, but how we respond and the speed at which we respond absolutely are. In the midst of one of the most profound public health and economic crises the world has ever experienced, we just saw how quickly businesses and society can transform when necessary. And if businesses have been able to transform quickly and effectively in the face of COVID-19, it shows that they can meet the challenge of the other massive disruptions that will shape our future. I'm very excited for the panel today. Thank you, Carol, for moderating this important discussion on the forces of disruption with the leaders at the forefront of managing through them. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Simon. Well, great context and setup for us. Let's get to that CEO panel. It is my pleasure to welcome Mitchell Baker, CEO and Chairwoman of Mozilla, Joanne Cravoiserat, she is the CEO of Tapestry. We've also got with us Richard Gelfond, CEO of the IMAX Corporation, and Mark Koplamazian, he is president and CEO of Hyatt Hotels Corporation. It's really like a dream panel because you guys are coming from different walks of life. Before we get going and before we start talking about disruption being an economic driver, I do wanna ask you all about the outlook, what visibility you have, because I feel like we're all trying to gauge when do we get to kind of the post-pandemic side of things. And, you know, recently we just got some news from J&J. &J. We're having a pause here in the U.S. about the usage of that vaccine. It's a reminder that it's not a straight path forward. So, Mark, let me start with you. The hospitality industry shut down by the pandemic. Um, how is the outlook? What do you see? Well, um, first of all, Carol, thanks for having me on the panel. Um, I would say that, you know, we've, we've been uh, enjoying some very positive momentum since the end of January this year in the United States. Um, China went through a shutdown and has reopened again and is growing significantly uh, post reopening. But um, I would say that the as much as we see booking activity uh, steadily increase, we're also positioned to uh, be ready for a potential um, retraction. And the only reason we are is not because I have a crystal ball. I, the one thing I've learned over this past year is that that's not possible. But uh, we've become conditioned to just um, recognize that the path forward is not uh, able to be predicted much past the coming week or so. And so we remain ready to uh, pivot if we need to. There's no evidence that that's um, a problem at this moment, but you know there are more surges that we're seeing uh, due to the new variants um, that are now the dominant uh, caseload in many countries, uh, quickly becoming the, the primary one in the United States. So we, we remain um, ready for a, a retrenchment, but um, so far we've seen positive momentum. Joanne, come on in on this, because retail, too, anything with brick and mortar was really shut down. Uh, you have brick and mortar, you have e-commerce. Tell us, though, about your brands, whether it's Coach, Kate Spade, or Stuart Weitzman. What's the outlook? What do you anticipate for the coming six months, 12 months? Well, I will say we're optimistic, but the, the operative word, you know, over the past year has really been agility. Um, you know, echoing Mark's comments, uh, we had very little visibility coming through the pandemic as to what the trends would be. And our focus as a, co as a company has been to get closer to our consumer, 
to lean into digital and data and analytics tools that are becoming more available. We were seeing some of these disruptions happen pre-pandemic and really embracing that and then becoming a leaner and more agile organization so that we can be more responsive as we see these trends unfold. I will tell you that a year ago, we weren't talking about or thinking about the opportunity to see a vaccine roll out quickly and, and we are here now. Uh, there has been a setback, uh, particularly with the news today, but we continue to be optimistic. You know, I think our customers are optimistic. They're, they're looking forward to getting out and embracing the, the physical world again. And uh, we've been encouraged by the amount of support and the amount of engagement we've seen all the way through the pandemic with our brands. And, and we think we're well positioned and, and believe we're well positioned as we come out of the pandemic to continue to serve our customers. You said Agile, there's tons of books, but this is one that I recently interviewed, Doing Agile Right. We're all trying to figure out how do you get through. Rich, you like so many others on our panel today, you went into COVID early because of your exposure over in Asia. You came out of it earlier because of your exposure in Asia, China specifically. How better are things? How are things going? Are people coming back to theaters? Yeah, where people feel safe, Carol, and in fact, they are safe, they're coming back to theaters in some cases, even in record numbers. So um, China, for example, we, we're, we operate in 84 countries. And in mm -hmm. China, we typically do about 10% of the Chinese box office on 1% of the screen. So Chinese New Year is the biggest movie going time of the year in China. It's around February. And this year was up 30% over the record, which was 2019. Um, in Japan, we had a film called Demon Slayer, which became the highest grossing film in the history of Japan, highest grossing IMAX film as well, despite capacity limitations a couple months ago. So there's no question in my mind where it's safe, it's gonna bounce back, and it already is in a big way. Um, you look at North America, we just had Godzilla versus Kong, which as you know, opened way stronger than people thought to around $50 million its first weekend. Europe is a little slower, a little bit more troubling, as is Latin America. So I think you really have to look at this on a region-by-region region basis. And again, as, as, as others were just saying, I don't think you could get too high or too low. One of my favorite business sayings, it's never as good as it looks or as bad as it seems. So I think you have to look, at, as a trend-wise, it's getting better and not get too distracted by the short-term news. We say that in broadcast, it never is as good as it feels and it's never as bad as it feels. Um, Mitchell, come on in on this, Firefox. I feel like we've all been online so much more, right? Obviously, working from home, we've all been browsing a lot more. Has Firefox and Mozilla benefited from what has happened over the last year? And, and I say that because there are companies that actually came out winners you know, during the pandemic. Um, and I'm just curious how you guys saw it. What we've seen in the last year is change in habits. You know, the title disruption, I think, is quite real here because even online, people's habits are changing, how they're, what they're doing, you, you, you can see that. And so I would say, you know, Mozilla, our goal is a, a better internet. Uh, in, and the, the reason that our organization exists is to build a better internet. We do it through the market, so we're a software vendor, you know, like others, but our, our actual motivation is something quite different. And so I, if Firefox has done quite well in the last year, and in the bigger picture, I'd say, you know, both the good and the bad of the current state of the internet have been magnified. And so obviously, in the larger picture, we'd say we'd really succeeded because we're all living online and doing things online we hadn't imagined before. Um, but also the issues with the nature of online life and the way our engagement works are so obvious. And so, you know, with Firefox, we try to address that now even more. How do you search things? How do you find what you want? How do you find with Pocket, you know, content that's worth your time, not clickbait? how to test out ways of engagement that aren't about building outrage for more engagement so that our, um, you might say the better side of human nature can be more reflected in, in online life. And that of course is a work in progress. 
Well, you know, when it comes to disruption, I'm looking at the four of you and I'm thinking, okay, is it a world where I'm not going to business travel as much and not go to Hyatt hotels? Am I going to, Joanne, be living in my jeans and yoga pants? Am I going to continue that in fashion not so important? Is it rich? I'm going to sit on my couch and just constantly stream. And, you know, Mitchell, am I going to continue still browsing or do I go back out into the world? And, I'm, you know, Mark, as we look at the disruption that's happened, how has it impacted you? How are you approaching kind of getting business travelers back, travelers back in general? Well, first and foremost, I would say that rumors of the death of business travel have been greatly exaggerated. Um, we're seeing remarkable interest among corporations um, getting back to convenings, uh, getting back to meetings. Um, I think there, there are some basic issues that uh, a lot of tech company executives who were talking up their own book with respect to the uh, digital platforms that are now commonplace um, miss, which is that the power of human connection remains um, significant and I think essential to uh, life going forward. But that, that's true on the leisure side and on the business side. So do I think that you know, two years from now, post uh, herd immunity and full vaccination, or to the extent of uh, the people who want to be vaccinated being vaccinated, do I think that it's going to look the same as 2019? No. Do I think that the general volume of travel will be similar? The answer is, or better, the answer is yes. Because there is this basic human need to go and explore that's on the leisure side. And companies really rely on building culture and differentiating the, who they are through the way it feels to people more than the paycheck or the career path. And so uh, most of our big customers are big employers of, um, of people who are doing systems integration, consulting, uh, the big four accounting firms, and all the tech companies. That really represents our top 10 customers. And um, all of them are expressing concerns about how they're going to maintain a, um, a sense of community and a sense of culture uh, and purpose in a time when there is more remote working going on. So we, we intend to be a part of that through uh, new programming and new ways of using our hotel properties. Well, and I want to get into the specifics in terms of disruption. Go ahead, come on in. Yeah. Well, I'm going to jump in as you asked at the beginning and just say I Please. couldn't agree more with something Mark said at the beginning, which was the narrative put forth by talking your own book. So, with all due respect to Mozilla and to others, um, I do think that there's a recency bias and there's meaning whatever's happening today is going to happen forever. And I'm talking your own book. So, we all know Netflix is saying, you know, people are going to stream forever, and that's the new answer to everything. But I don't know about you, my wife and I, we stopped watching TV except for news and sports like two months ago because we can't take it anymore. And I still read the reports about how people are never going to go to movies. But to Mark's point, gathering and culture and being part of a social organization are embedded in the human race. And if I could turn it back, because you represent the media, Carol, I think, you know, the media has a little bit fallen for that bait. And I don't think there's been enough saying like, yeah, you're locked in your in your kitchen. It doesn't mean you're not going to restaurants. You're locked in your living room. Doesn't mean you're going to leave your couch. So I couldn't right. agree more. Yeah. I, so to, just to say, like, um, it's very rare that Mozilla's uh, lumped in with the tech giants and and what what they have to say. So um, I might take a little. You know, I appreciate the the the, the respect. I think for Mozilla, we are not advocates that everything stays online and people don't want to go out and be people. I think we probably are advocates that there is change and that this has been a massive spike in disruption and more is coming. So this question of what's online, what's really better physical, what are the new mixtures of them, I think is very real. Um, and certainly, you know, the the uh, you know the joys of of IMAX, for example, are <laughs> impossible to get at home. So. Well, I'll give it yeah, I'd love to jump in here because I think, you know, what, what the way we see the world is that the digital is an amplification of physical. It's not it's not an either or it is an and in our world. And, you know, I think some of those digital behaviors will be sticky. What we're seeing from our customer is, you know, and I'll, I'll use China as a market that has has reopened and, and recovered for the most part. And we're seeing growth in our brick and mortar stores and growth in digital. So it's it's an and it's a way that consumers are engaging with brands. 
uh, it now includes this digital, these digital platforms. What we saw at the beginning of the, of the pandemic actually was our customers reaching out to us and looking for us to engage them with our associates from the stores. We've had tremendous innovation across the world with associates getting online and doing virtual shopping parties where consumers couldn't come into the physical store, but they wanted, Mark, to your point, that human connection. They wanted the styling advice or the gift giving advice that our associates are so well positioned to give. And so we're finding now that our associates and our, and our sales store managers are becoming social media influencers of their own and engaging with consumers on these social media platforms and, and consumers really wanting that connection and, and that community around our brands like Kate Spade, Coach, and Stuart Weitzman. They, they want to feel connected. Um, so we're seeing, again, China is a great example. We continue to see strength in our digital business globally and expect as, as, the, as the economies open up and the physical world opens up, our consumers will come back and engage in, in our physical stores as well. So what specific, Mark, come on in, what specific disruption have you seen that is going to turn out to be an economic driver for you guys longer term? Well, look, I, I think the, the big reaction and response that many in our industry undertook um, when the pandemic uh, hit us now 13 months ago was to understand and quickly try to accelerate the development of digital tools that would assist in allowing uh, the the some elements of the hotel experience to be more self-service. So um, the incidence of digital check-in, for example, or using digital mm -hmm. keys, which have been around for a few years, has gone up a lot. But we've, we've also extended into more digital resources for uh, exploration of travel and booking of travel. And very importantly, some of the, the key friction points on property, like um, in our restaurants, for example, we recognize that the stresses of, say, a family of four, one parent with two kids there wanting to get off the table and go to the pool, having to flag a server for the bill and then provide a, a form of payment and then wait for it to come back and so forth and so on. It's a lot of friction and we digitize that now. So you can order through your phone, you can pay through your phone. Um, and this is actually opening up something that uh, Joanne just referenced, um, which is the engagement of our colleagues now with guests is all about their their experience and what else we can be doing for them, not about um, getting the folio to the guest for them to be able to sign. So those kinds of uh, advancements, which are continuing right. to accelerate in our world, will be with us for a long time to come. Rich, what about with your business? I mean, do you need to do anything to get people back to theaters to feel comfortable after the pandemic? What's been your experience? You talk about China. Do you have to change anything or is there anything that came out of the pandemic and what you saw that will be kind of an, a driver for you, an economic driver going forward? So actually it relates back to the safety factor. I think it just can't be safe, but I think people have to feel safe. So I think mm -hmm. you have to step up your game on consumer service a little bit. Thank you for coming back to the theaters. We missed you. I think you have to you know, whether it's things like in, the way you get in and the way you exit and separating people, there, there are little things. But for us, Carol, we use the time more and much like the others have talked about on um, complementary lines of business. So we have something called IMAX Enhance, which um, when you're in your home on a very large TV streaming or whatever, we can make that image look a lot better. We started an artificial intelligence joint venture with a very accomplished partner so we can up-res images, whether it's on computer to computer monitors or TV screens. And we've been working on a direct-to-consumer app because our model is a little bit of a B2B uh, business, so that way we can more communicate with our consumers. We also are wiring all of our theaters in the network so we could provide uh, live content or think of a global premiere done simultaneously mm -hmm. in hundreds of theaters. So rather than you know there being a weakness in our core business, we looked at it as an opportunity to build ancillary businesses. One thing you said to me, I know in our planning call, uh, Rich, is that you can't be a one-trick pony. That's one thing that, that really has stayed with you as a result of the past 12, 13 months. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that's really scary but true is that this probably isn't the only pandemic we're gonna see in our lifetimes. And we've seen 
smaller versions before. So I don't think you could just sit around and say, gee, I hope this isn't going to happen. I think you need um, to come up with ancillary revenue streams and different forms of diversification. So when, I won't even say if, but when something like this happens again, um, you know, your cash flow st still um, keeps going. So I think that is an important point, Carol. Joanne, your digital business, you talked about it, doubled in the past 12 months. What do stores look like in the future? Do they still matter? Yeah, I, I want to add, too, that, the, you know, the disruption that we've seen in the last year has really enabled us to move faster and innovate faster um, behind the transformation initiatives we already had underway. We were seeing the digital trends happening in the space uh, before the pandemic, and they certainly have accelerated uh, through the pandemic. We were seeing a consumer wanting to engage with brands more digitally and physically, so that omni-channel experience we talked about a lot. Um, and, and we believe that stores still matter. And as I mentioned, we see digital as amplifying the experience for the consumer, but that, that experience and that physical touch point still matters. The role of the store is changing and, and having omni-channel services, you know, buy online, pick up in store, curbside pickup wasn't really a thing before the pandemic. We all worked very quickly and we did, we worked very quickly within weeks to implement it. So we're seeing innovation and it happening. with us? Joanne, it'll stay uh, with us? You know, I think to the extent that a consumer wants that level of convenience, absolutely. Um, you know, the level of which, you know, the level of each of these omni-channel capabilities, the penetration will depend, I think, on what's going on in the consumer's life and, and frankly, in the in the backdrop. So if, if they're not comfortable coming into a store and want to and want to transact virtually, if they want to have a shopping appointment at a time where they think it's either more convenient for them or less crowded in our stores and they'll feel more comfortable to have a shopping appointment, they'll be able to make shopping appointments. Um, we've invested and will continue to invest in what that store experience is. We opened a, a store in Shanghai that's a completely digitally immersive experience that uses gaming technology that can, can adapt to what any consumer walking in needs or what, you know, so it's a, it's a very unique experience for each consumer. So it's those kinds of investments to make that store experience unique and, and very uh, special for, for each of our brands. Those are, the, those are the places we're investing. Mitchell, like Joanne and Tapestry, you guys over at Mozilla have been in the midst of a transformation. I think you said it was the middle of a mess right now when we were talking that there was a lot going on in this past year. So the disruption that you've had to deal with, how is that helping or hurting you to innovate and to deal with that transformation? I would agree uh, with Joanne that the, the the recent disruption has accelerated our transformation. And our transformation is from like the very early part of the internet. Like Mozilla's like the oldest thing on the consumer internet, like literally. And so in internet time, 20 or 30 years, we're ancient, right? Which has benefits and value and credibility. And you know we know what we're talking about. There's been a modernization piece. So the transformation for us are things about how to combine our DNA of real privacy and security with information, i.e. data and AI. And how do you do these things? How do we at Mozilla do these things differently in ways that we think are better? So for example, information is power and I want all that information about me. You know, the machine learning systems probably understand how I behave better than I do. You know, the data is there and what motivates me and what makes me purchase, what makes me happy, what makes me outraged. You know, is it three seconds or five seconds? Is it red or green? You know, all of these things are known, but not by me. And so the question for us is that information is real power. Um, how do we take that and put it at the hands of the individual? Like, I want that information, especially the health information. Uh, and so that transformation is a lot of product exploration and it's a lot of deep technical work to say, how can we use information in a way that's different and has the individual at the center? Very similar sort of customized experience as you were describing in the stores. Because some people, you know, want the information broadcast widely and some of us want to control it more. So that's the kind of exploration that's underway and that's been driven through this disruption. Yeah, I hope that I well, love that too. In, in our sure. stores where, you know, we have, as part of our transformation effort, um, applied data and analytics more fully in our, in, our, um, in our value chain so that we are leveraging that uh, technology and those capabilities to tailor what goes into a store to be more reflective of what consumers want. 
So really understanding the consumer and getting that sharper focus, leveraging data to be able to help us make decisions that make that experience so much better for our consumers. And that's, that's really a part of, of our transformation. How is the data though that you rely on disrupted in the past year? Mark, you had said something to me in our planning call um, about needing to find new signals um, to create better visibility that you know, the old algorithm tools and pricing data, like they just didn't work anymore. So I'm just curious how your data has been disrupted and that how that newer data will stay with you in the future to predict kind of where the business is going. Yeah, it's been a great unlock of um, uh, creativity. You know, the, what, what struck me listening to Mitchell and Joanne is um, there's a, the, that old exp expression, which is necessity is the mother of invention. And uh, in our case, you know, 95% of our business went uh, went away overnight about a year ago. So um, we realized quickly that all of the models and uh, both pricing models, but also behavioral models that we've got for different groups and different travelers was basically irre irrelevant at that moment in time. And so we thought, okay, well, we can't rely on anything that we've had in the past. And all of the algorithmically based models that we had utilized um, were of no use. So we sort of went to uh, went back to the drawing board with a completely white sheet of paper and started tracking things like uh, mobility data, um, engagement data, search data from all of those from Google. Um, we looked at TSA information and uh, tried to also keep track of we went even so far as to try to keep track of the fleet planning for airlines because there's a long lead time for airlines planning their fleet deployment. And we thought, well, you know, it's interesting to, to speculate about where travel might surge, but if there's no lift, if there's no airlift to those markets, um, even though the radius of drive mm -hmm. to, driving actually expanded a lot from maybe a max of 250 miles to over a thousand miles in many cases, um, we still depend on air travel. So those are the things that we started to go towards. And we've learned a lot about how we can actually, with those data streams, enhance um, how we are forecasting, yes, during this disrupted period of time, but I think a lot of that's going to stay with us. You know, Rich, you had a good question um, that you said, I'd love to ask everybody. And, and, it, and the question was, what narratives that are coming from the media and everyone else that the world is changing forever that you think are false narratives. And we've talked about, I know certainly here at Bloomberg a lot, that we're all gonna be working from home, uh, that we're all gonna be streaming, we're not going to restaurants, the demise of the big city, uh, all these big things, or as I kidded with Joanne, that I'm gonna be living in my yoga pants. I mean, what are the narratives that are out there? And, you know, Rich, let me start with you. You talked about the streaming narrative. Are there other narratives too that you think we need to be smart about that maybe it's not gonna all change or maybe it will change dramatically? I think some of the narratives are um, that, you know, that will, let's start with what will change is I do think um, that streaming and distribution patterns for specialty content are going to be different. So I think if there's a movie that's geared to a very small demographic or could be a foreign language film, um, things like that, I think it is much better and much more efficient to stream those to targeted audiences where you won't have to spend all that money on marketing because it won't be recouped. Um, but I think by the same token, what we've seen in other countries in the world is that even though there are alternatives in the home, people are anxious to get out of the home um, in, in greater numbers than people are talking about. So you know, let's talk about what I mentioned briefly in Japan, this movie called Demon Slayer. I mean, imagine at 50 to 75% of capacity, it became by far the biggest grossing movie in the history of Japan. So that suggests to me the concept of pent up demand and you don't know it until you see it. But probably all of you have seen it in your businesses so far where you've been open and safe. And you know, frankly, I'll talk about airline travel since I got my second vaccine and hotel staying. I mean, I'm less price sensitive than I was before because I had a, over a year without spending any money um, because you know, I'm not 30 years old. Um, I, I'm much happier to spend money on experiences than before. And I think that's a narrative that maybe people haven't gone deep enough into, Carolyn. Mm -hmm. They know little changes they've seen during the pandemic, such as, you know, the things that we've all talked about here, less business travel, not going to the movies. 
But I don't think people have really dug deep enough and said, you know, your own mortality, which everybody's faced, including you know, way younger people that are used to facing that. I mean, those are kind of societal changes that it's going to be very interesting to see afterward, right. you know, how people's lives and philosophies are changed. You right. know, I we find it lost. interesting that there's, sorry, Carol, just a quick comment. Oh. So many people talk about content. Everything is about content. Well, there's this other thing called experience that really matters. And I think, you know, IMAX is known for this, right? But uh, I think a lot of what Rich just touched on is about the experience of it, not just the content itself. And, and I'll just add that, that our, our consumer continues to have an emotional connection to our product. And, you know, there may be elements of comfort that, that carry forward from the, from the pandemic that maybe we'll want to wear a yoga pants a, a few more days of the week. But we are seeing the consumer come out and really embrace our product with an emotional uh, response and reaction. We've seen a couple of our bags at Kate Spade, a, 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 very, a very cute heart-shaped crossbody bag go viral on, on uh, TikTok, so these platforms where our consumers are organically finding, there's a, a new one out now, a strawberry-shaped bag that, is, that has gone viral. These are not things that consumers need, they're things that they want, and they have that emotional connection to our product. We're seeing nice response and a, a beginning of a wedding season, perhaps, that may come back and, and, a, and a lean into bridal and dressy. Um, and so I think as you start to think about these real life events that people have put on hold for a year, you know, I, we expect that, that fashion will be back. And, you know, there may be other elements of comfort that stay with us for a little while, but fashion will be back almost, it almost feels like a back to school moment, right? Your first day of school when you want to go out in the world and dress up and, and uh, show your friends. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of optimism and some pent up demand for um, actually getting out in the real world and engaging and then engaging emotionally with the products that, that we carry. Got to say, I bought a pair of heels in the midst of the pandemic and couldn't wait to finally wear them. And it took me a few months, but I got them on. Uh, Mitchell, what about you in terms of false narratives that are out there, whether it's in the media, that we need to be smart about that you think are either not going to stay with us or will stay with us? Well, first I'll say I, too, am very eager to get out in the real world. I miss being out, that is for sure. Um, and in particular, what we find are those uh, spontaneous creative conversations are very hard to figure out how to do online. But in the disruption and the narrative piece, I would say we, we uh, have a narrative that's sort of either or, like we're going back or we understand the online life. And I think the narrative is we've had this spike in disruption and innovation and how does digital life interact with physical life. And that those changes aren't done. So at the end of this spike, we've moved up a plateau in the uh, a higher level of integration. So maybe curbside pickup was an innovation, but there'll be other forms of innovation. Uh, and so I think this narrative that is, we're going back or it is the way it is now, none of those is really correct. And, and we're just, I think, should see this disruption as the beginning of a long innovative cycle where we've had this um, crisis that has shifted us out of our mindsets, but that we'll see ongoing changes in what's actually real life or physical life or digital life. And that relationship between the experience or your sales associates, we could think of that as maybe step three and something that's going to be 50 or 100 steps long and how we have an experience with a product that's unique to me and maybe in a store and, you know, maybe I go shopping and then I go to a movie. You know, all of those things, I think, are, are all in a the, in the state of flux right now. More hey, exciting to in out and actually do them, but... Yeah. Be nice, right? Um, we have a poll question that we recently put out across Bloomberg's global social media channels, which I'd like to bring into the conversation, get your thoughts on. We asked the question, what is the biggest disruption facing your business today? Remote working, 26.4%. Automation and AI, same thing, 26.4%. Data privacy and security, 23% roughly. Competitive landscape, almost 24%. Rich, what, what do you think about that? What's your reaction to that poll? Well, my reaction to the poll is um, when I looked at it on the side on the screen, I thought a lot of those are opportunities, frankly. So I think changing competitive landscape, as the panel was talking about before, it forces you to think differently into new businesses maybe you haven't thought of. You know, AI, as I mentioned to you, it's something we've explored because I think it opens doors. I think if I had to choose one, I think remote working is an interesting one. And, um, you know, I, I, my guess is, 
tech companies may feel a little different than experiential companies. My guess is that um, those of us in out-of-home ways think about it remotely. And I spent most of the pandemic um, at a second home I have out on Long Island. But as movies, theaters started to open and um, sets started to open and directors came back, I strongly had the point of view that it wasn't really appropriate for me to sit in my hot tub in October and think about how to reopen the world for at-home entertainment. So I felt strongly that we as an organization needed to lean in um, to getting back to work. And you know, it may be different for different kinds of organizations, but some of you were just saying a minute ago about spontaneous ideas. And I've been back in my office in Manhattan since um, last September. And I, I think it's just unleashed so much creativity, but more I think it's a question of leadership. So can you really lead the world out from a pandemic into doing different things from your home, maybe in some industries, but in general, I'm biased. And I, you know, I, I, think, I think in my mind, that's one of the ones we have to deal with. We only have a few minutes left and I wanna quickly get all of your responses on this. Mitchell, come in on this, because you guys have been working from home for a long time at Mozilla, right? That's part of what you do. Yes, we've been a remote culture from, well, from our beginning, 20 years probably, from the you know, developer DNA source. Uh, what I would say is that uh, your poll is interesting to me because uh, either you pick very well or you know, they all have high responses. I would say for yeah. this that I think everything is still in a state of flux. Uh, and I mean that in an optimistic way. There's opportunities, but that we are in a time of change. Um, we've had the spike of disruption, but the change will continue. So for those that you know like change and look forward and and you know want to do new things, it's a phenomenal time with with a fair amount of opportunity in it. Um, some people don't like change, so that will be hard. But but we are in that that time of change, and I guess it's no surprise since I do have this tech, um, you know, I I I do have this uh, connection to technology. I would say automation and AI because I think it affects all of the others and everything else you could put on that list. Um, from competitive landscape, obviously data privacy and security, but working at home, what's it like? Who do you engage with? You know, all of those things. Um, I think, I, I think uh, uh, and so this question of what is trustworthy AI, Mozilla has a very large initiative on that. Not just trusted, which is human emotion, but trustworthy. What are the criteria of a system that is worthy of trust, especially one that knows more about us than we do? Uh, and underlies increasingly more and more. Mark, you want to come in on the poll and your takeaway? Yeah, so I have to say, <clears throat> I look across those topics and the um, reaction I've got is to look through a human lens and ask the question, what is the human experience associated with each of these? Some of it relates to trust or trustworthiness, as Mitchell just mentioned, um, especially over the past year watching the polarization um, of this country and, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> and how uh, information flow and sources have become um, almost impossible to decipher in terms of what the validity of what's being reported is is actually is actually. Um, so that's one issue. And th but the the second issue is just a normal life question, which is, if remote working, I, I, I agree with what Mitchell said. We are we are in a state of flux. This will look different a year from now. I don't know exactly how, but it will look, I think what could look very, very different. So we need to keep our minds open. We have to maintain a beginner's mind as we experience this. But from my perspective, I'm looking at it through the lens of human experience. Um, I think this whole uh, topic of well being, holistic well being, is essential for us to remember because the stresses that come with a lot of what's on this list. Uh, are not appropriately discussed or taken into account when we have these discussions. This is the other book I was going to show you, Beating Burnout at Work. I mean, these are the books that we've been talking about constantly. Joanne, your take on the poll here. Well, I, I concur with with what much of what's already been said. Um, you know, as we, as I mentioned, we embarked on a transformation prior to the pandemic hitting. And we saw many of these trends, maybe without remote working, but we saw many of these trends accelerating uh, in the marketplace. And, and, and I do see this as opportunity. The competitive landscape is changing. And I think automation and AI are important disruptors across all industries. And, and our focus at Tapestry has been to really position our company to be able to take advantage 
and win in an environment that's changing like this. So, so uh, you know, I started with a comment on agility. Agility matters, and setting up the organization to be able to adopt this new technology and leverage it for the benefit of our business, for the benefit of our consumers, is something that we've been focused on. And I think, you know, uh, also according to the poll, I see it, you know, continuing to be important in the future. And I think it'll it'll help us win. And, and I agree with the comments around remote working. You know, we're not going to go back to the way it used to be. So the question is, how can we make um, you know, this environment sustainable, sustainable for doing our business in the right way going forward and sustainable for our people to make sure to ensure the well-being of our teams um, so that we can continue to thrive going forward. Um, I'm going to do a rapid round so you all have to be kind of quick, but I want to ask you um, a question. Rich, this one first to you. So I feel like this has been a grand experiment, uh, a very painful experiment at times the past 12, 13 months. Would you say disruption uh, became an opportunity to grow an economic driver for your business, yes or no? Yes, for sure. I think the new circumstances, um, you know, humans are very adaptable and the, the, the will to survive is primary. And I think you put those together, it forces you to look at different ways of doing things. Mitchell, your take. Absolutely. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Uh, things we never really imagined could be done online are online. And so that's a driver of opportunity, challenge, ability to move in all sorts of different ways, you know, from, as I said, browsing to content, but also what's your experience engaging in content and what is it like to be online? And that overall experience, and I'll, I'll even maybe echo Mark and say, um, how does online, how do, how do we uh, amend it so it drives us closer towards holistic well-being? Mark, your take. Absolutely, yes. Um, I think probably the biggest uh, lasting dividend, if you will, from this past year is a changed way of working. I think going faster, being more adaptable, um, having uh, applying a growth mindset at every turn, these are the things that will persist and continue to add value over time. And Joanne? Yeah, I'll wrap it up by saying that, you know, I agree that it's been a catalyst. Um, it's allowed us, you know, to, to build a case for change. It was quite clear when all of our stores closed that there was change that we needed to do. And I, I would argue that it, it's, it helped us accelerate and be more bold uh, than we would have been otherwise. So, um, and the innovation has been tremendous across this past year. I've been weaving some of our audience questions into the general discussion, but I have one last one I just want to quickly ask you guys. What do you think will be the next big disruptor and how can we prepare for that? Just quickly, Joanne, what do you think will be the next big disruptor? Uh, you know, I think the continuation, as Mitchell said, I'll echo that. I, I don't think we're done. I think we're in the first few steps of a technology disruption and a digital, uh, a digital as an enabler. And I think we're in the early innings of that. Mark? Um, you know, as we now believe that this um, this coronavirus could be uh, an endemic uh, uh, part part of our lives going forward, I think how we respond uh, to future. I think I think Richard was the one who said there's a certainty of another uh, pandemic in our lifetimes. I think you know how we collectively respond to these things going forward is going to be another you know, unfortunately, another disruption in how we organize information, how we coordinate, um, and how we deploy um, either vaccines in the future or other healthcare. Mitchell. I'd say mindset, because all sorts of things will happen, whether it's a pandemic or, you know, flooding you know, of millions of people, you know, you know, with water uh, levels rising, who knows, you know, so, uh, so I would say I think the next big disruptor is really mindset, which is partly our relationship to technology, but partly our relationship to experience. Um, you know, is that consistent? If you have these great experiences, is it going to be periodic in life as these things happen? Um, can we get back to us or, or, or work our way to a new sort of sustainability, not just for us and our people and teams, but planet wise and weather wise as well? Rich, final thought for you. What do you think is going to be the next big disruptor? I think it's going to be artificial intelligence. I think artificial intelligence is kind of you know, what the internet was a few decades ago. And, you know, there, there are so many simple things, whether it's ordering a cab or food for takeout, um, you can't see where they are. But I think 
AI is so big, it's going to change our way of life in ways we can't see. Folks, thank you so much. Um, I could talk for hours with you. Uh, we learned so much. Uh, Rich, Mitchell, Mark, Joanne, thank you, thank you. Be well. Really appreciate it. And I do want to thank our fan. Yes, okay. thank you. And I do want to thank our fantastic panel. We had a fascinating, wide-ranging conversation. We're going to be bringing in Jeff Sonnenfeld of Yale in just a moment to continue this discussion. Before doing so, though, I'd like to briefly pass it back to Simon Freakley of Alex Partners, get some of his thoughts on our CEO discussion. Simon, over to you. Thanks, Carol. Really terrific panel discussion. And the themes that came up absolutely underline not just the output of our research, but also at Alex Partners, our experience of working with clients on so many of these disruptions. You know, the, the discussion brought a few things home for me. Now, number one, technology is not just a disruptor itself, but connectivity is an accelerant to so many other disruptions. The point, of course, that disruptive forces present opportunities to businesses, not just challenges. So how do we lean into those opportunities and be agile and capitalize on them? Which of course leads to this mindset point that Joanne raised, how we have the right mindset to take advantage of those new markets and opportunities. This leads of course straight into leadership, how leaders husband their companies through these choppy times. And I know that Jeff Sonnenfeld is about to have a discussion with you. And Jeff, of course, uh, has rich experience in the whole area of leadership. So I really enjoyed the panel discussion. Look forward to your discussion with Jeff. Thank you. And back to you, Carol. All right, Simon, thank you so much. What a great summary of our panel. And next up, it's my pleasure to introduce Jeffrey Sonnenfeld. He's Senior Associate Dean for Leadership Studies at the Yale University School of Management. And Jeff, so great to have you here with us. There's so much to talk about. Um, you heard the panel, you heard what Simon had uh, to say you about disruptive you forces. To Give me some of your thoughts about uh, what you just heard. Uh, well, thank you. I, I think Simon did an exceptionally good job of capturing uh, this theme of technology uh, along with uh, what the disruption itself means in terms of finding opportunity. The Chinese character, uh, of course, the characters for the, the term crisis is made up of of, of two lines, one line which uh, uh, indicates danger, another one indicates change and opportunity. And I think that, that Simon captured that well, and Alex Partners often goes into situations of despair and finds great new ways of reinvention. And if we took a look at these four companies, Carol, uh, there are a whole semester's worth of knowledge. In fact, you could have had a, a great hour discussion with just any one of these people because of the way they've been reinventing their companies through all this. They're, wouldn't you agree, they're very optimistic in their approach, very, uh, I think, uh, 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 not at all uh, caught up in some of the, the angst uh, and, the, and the danger of it all. They, they were finding opportunity. So I thought that if you have one category of things they talked about, which was how do they see through the crisis in the midst of it? Uh, I think that Mark, for example, was talking about in the hotel business, we weren't quite sure what was going to be happening from week to week. And there's a whole set of issues having to do with the crisis itself. And then coming out of it, how do we see ourselves differently? And you asked some great questions about there about the false narratives and what's really gonna last and, and what's the new normal. So in the first part, I think that this is a group that is not caught up in hand-wringing. They, they, mm. uh, they weren't coming up with empty cliches. I think it was, it was very important as you saw that Mozilla said, as, as, as Mitchell was saying that we have always been operating, and, and they sort of came to their fore, operating uh, through technology, operating remotely. Whereas Rich was saying, we're just trying to figure out where the new opportunities were, that, that not to believe the bad news, that, that we're gonna be uh, basically circling the drain of despair uh, because people will be coming back and that there'll be this surge of interest, surge of opportunity. So not to get caught up in the hand-wringing, and, and of course, he was talking about in Japan and other places as people are coming on, out on the other side of, of, this, of this crisis is they're finding there's great enthusiasm. Mark was also finding that, but they also wanted to be realistic. And I, I thought that, uh, that Mark was great about not talking about the empty, empty cheerleading and hand-wringing, not to promise more in the hotel business mm -hmm. than they knew for sure was going to be there, but also how to, how to keep that line of communications open throughout, that their role of the leader they realized that they, they needed a lot of fireside chats. They needed ongoing, they had to help shape meeting at a time of crisis. People didn't understand what was going on. And I thought all four of them were very good about coming out with, 
with shaping what that new meeting is. Uh, I, I think uh, that they... Uh, well, Jeff, let me just jump in for a second, because I do feel like when it comes to crisis management, I feel like it's been turned on its head during the pandemic. And I saw it, I felt like firsthand when we started reaching out to companies, you know, 13 months ago, I think people were terrified to talk about that they had no visibility on their business, right? People were initially maybe afraid to talk about George Floyd and racism. And then all of a sudden they started to come out because they needed to, or their employees pressured them or their customers pressured them. Tell me about crisis management. What did we learn? Has it changed forever as a result of the pandemic? Because it sounds like I picked up on that a little bit, certainly uh, from our conversation with four CEOs. Yeah, I think that's right. I think we did see is that uh, when you talk about flashpoints, whether or not it's uh, the voting issues of today or some of the some of the issues of wedge issues that Mark was referring to, that sort of caught them by surprise how divisive society could be, and also a lot of the unknowns, just strategically, as you were referring to, people were a little bit afraid of for CEOs. Can we, uh, when they realize we're making claims about getting tomorrow's, you know, another day, and you know, like coming off like Scarlett O'Hara uh, with simplistic uh, promises. That uh, to take your lumps and and not to worry, we this this too shall pass. We don't know how long it'll pass, how long it'll take. And yet we're looking to the CEO for the answers. They got increasingly comfortable by saying, "Here's what we know. Here's what we don't know. Here's how we close the gap." As we take a look at the research today, no matter who which survey outfit we look at, one thing they all agree with is that CEOs have a soaring p- platform of credibility. That as the media, sadly, Carol and ourselves in academia uh, in mm-hmm. public. Affairs, elected officials, whether or not it's the federal, state, or local level, or even the clergy have all been dropped down a peg in terms of public trust. But people like the four you had on this panel recognize they have a responsibility to speak to the crisis. And they're, they've become increasingly comfortable taking on that role, whether or not it was a strategic crisis or whether or not it's something going on in society. And what? answering that is that it's with, uh, now this wasn't true in 2008. It wasn't true in 2000. We looked with right. uh, some uh, concern, but it's true now. Business leaders are looked upon as a as a, a critical source of, of confidence, and uh, that's what these guys were saying. They have some different points of view. You know, obviously, uh, the uh, the sense of experience was way more important uh, for Joanne in retail and 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 Mark mm-hmm. and Rich than it was for for you know taking a look at Mozilla, where they're saying we're able to do a lot of innovation. Uh, through our technology, through leveraging online, because they've known how to do it. And they're not selling the in-person experience, uh, of course, as much as the others. But that notion of partnering that, you know, Joanne was talking about, how we we realized that we need to be staying nimble to reinvent our business. I thought uh, that Joanne was fast. Well, well, one thing I want to just, I want to jump in in, is that Rich um, Gelfand of IMAX, he said to me that early on in the crisis, uh, last year, that at some point an outside PR consultant, Jeff, said to him, listen, hide and be quiet. Uh, and I, I'm not sure if this was specifically about the pandemic, but also Black Lives Matter and so on and so forth. And Rick was kind of like, no, this is kind of what we need to be doing. We need to be out there. And I, I do wonder if that's changed. And I bring that up because, you know, here we are today, we have a letter uh, that's in the Wall Street Journal, um, or it's in the New York Times, it's in the Washington Post, hundreds of CEOs, whether it's Amazon, Starbucks, General Motors, uh, Google specifically, Warren Buffett, you know, coming out and saying basically that we stand for democracy. They're speaking out specifically against voting restrictions, looking at what's going on in Georgia and elsewhere around the country. Um, some of our CEO panel, we taped this earlier before that came out, and we reached out to them and Rich said, you know, not signed the letter, have been asked to, but you know they're welcome. They definitely support it. Uh, Joanne over Tapestry, they have a partnership with More Than a Vote. It's a fighting rights organization led by LeBron James, so they've been out there. Um, what is the responsibility of leaders in a time of disruption and innovation? Well, you know, I think this panel spoke to that well, and it's a great way to weave together where they were at, at, on this interview and, and the breaking headlines now is that all four of them in different ways spoke about the emotional side of both of their businesses uh, and of course a sense of safety uh, as part of the new normal, whether or not it's it's the wellness around uh, for their workers or the safety of the products, uh, who the heroes are is a respect for the front line. It's not just the people 
in the in the in, at the tops of the organizations. Remember how Rich said he felt guilty being at home in his hot tub in, in the Hamptons or whatever, as people were coming right. out in September, October to work on the front lines and making the films. He realized symbolically, to your point, he needed to be out there. And that was a, a very dramatic demonstration that Rich had in the emotional nature of, as Joanne was talking about, what these products represent. He's tying that into the headlines right now in terms of voting issues and others. They recognize that part of their job is to make meaning. And, and there are some, um, some I think, um, some communications consultants who weren't sure what the right answer was and how to script the CEOs. So they told them wrongly to hang back. They can't hang back. They have to be out there. And if they don't know answers, it's still reassuring to say, we don't know. For anybody uh, who's, who listens to us today that, that, that has a military background knows that when somebody's in the, in the foxholes, in the trench of, trenches of combat, it's just that the top brass says, we know you're there and we care. Uh, that's reassuring itself. Uh, it doesn't have all the answers. But somehow to be in touch and, and to have that line of communication going is, is extremely important. And we, we saw that we have some political leaders, unfortunately, in the last few days who have suggested that business leaders should stay quiet. We'll take your money and be quiet. Well, it's a, it's a, it's a statement of defiance with the ads and the public statements that you were just referring to, Carol. A statement of defiance that, no, we're not going to retreat. We think that it's part of our duty, part of our civic duty. Uh, we have to have a, a free functioning democracy to work well. And, and we have to have free markets work well side by side. It takes a free flow of communications. We don't want our leaders to be somehow hidden in dark, smoky rooms and aren't seen out there. So I think these people are, are very comfortable trying to explain what they knew, what they didn't know, how they, they changed their, their attitudes along the way. And Do you uh, think and this stays with us, Jeff, though, longer term? Or do you think it's just the right thing to do right now? I do wonder, post-pandemic, the innovation disruption, whether it's hybrid working, working from home, um, some of the different trends, and I, I tried to get to that in the panel about, you know, the narratives, which are false, which are real, what stays with us, what disruptors, you know, or innovations really stay with us going forward in your view? Does hybrid working, right. do we work from home? Do CEOs kind of have to have, uh, you know, a moment of reckoning to say, listen, we're going to have to accommodate workers. They were talking about hybridization in different ways. Uh, who are dominant uh, uh, to 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 move to the new technologies? As Mark talked about uh, the online sign-ins, I actually joined uh, uh, Penny Pritzker of of Mark's organization had invited me to join a a, 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 a an advisory board 30 years ago with the techno technological capability Mark talked about that wasn't implemented to bypass the front desk and do a lot of those things. And as as Mitchell said, the technology has accelerated us forward to do things we knew we should have done a long time ago. And Mark's example was a perfect example. There, were, there was not on the technological frontier to be able to do some of the things that Hyatt's doing now, but the hotels weren't doing it. So now they are. So those are some, some new normals that are changing. And Joanne was basically saying that, that, that we have seen things happening between the multi-channel approach that was going to unfold over the next five years, but it wound up happening over a five-month period. So dramatically right. accelerating that, that, so the, that curbside pickup and things. So that is an, some examples of new normal uh, that are there that that accelerated these changes that are coming, and I don't think it's a it's a passing it's a passing fad. We're going to revert back to something different. As Rich was talking about, even he was trying to figure out how, even though uh, when you when you asked that that tough question just about what are some of the disruptions coming that are overstated, that what are some of the false narratives, is of course Rich doesn't want to say that streaming line streaming is going to replace the film experience, but he did talk about. Uh, ways that they are adapting, that streaming will be much more specialized for small targeted uh, demographies or small targeted interest groups, and that they're trying to think about ways that they can use AI uh, to also reach in, into the computer mm -hmm. of experience. So that you can see both sides were trying to adapt uh, to do things a little differently with a, with a certain hybridization that we're not going back to the way things were, even though there's some things they were hoping for. Surely Joanne was hoping we come back to celebrating events and weddings come back and fashion comes back. They'll come back. I know all these people yes. planning weddings. <laughs> Jeff, one thing I do want to ask you, because this whole panel is about, you know, disruption leading to economic growth. You talk with a lot of CEOs. You're a go-to person when it comes to what CEOs, what's on their minds, what's going on with leadership. You know, what are you hearing from CEOs when it comes to the disruptive forces that, are going to be really good for their businesses. Yes, uh, 
is that, you know, if we've talked about so far what they've told us about drop the cheerleading, giving straight chalk, talk, and, and don't do hand-wringing, because these were not hand-wringing people. These were very optimistic, problem-solving people. And keeping the lines of communications open, we said there were some lessons they gave us. But this expect the new, norm, new normal you've gotten to, I think, is, is really important. It's just not going to be the same. And I think they've got good ideas about how they reinvent themselves going forward. But they have to make sure that we don't expect people that we're going to somehow uh, drop backwards in, in, in a nostalgic type way, uh, think that when all this passes, we'll go back to business as normal as it was. It's just not going to be there. So, you know, I think that's right. If you think of what these CEOs do well, and you look at the four of them collectively, it was, they were so eloquent. The, the, the use of imagery they have, and mm -hmm. in our respect, we find that personal dynamism is really important. That they use evocative imagery, and they're physically out there even through this pandemic. Secondly, there's something they were very good at. There's a lot of empathy for their workers and their customers. They had they were in touch with them, so that empathy was really important. A third one, they kept joking about one another, talking their book and things, uh, and, and directing some of that about technologists kind of overstating capabilities, uh, 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 teasing perhaps a little bit with Mitchell. Uh, but actually, none of them were talking their own. There's an authenticity. It's a really critical quality. Mm -hmm. You didn't feel anything being swept under the carpet. And, and yet, they also are not happy with the status quo as, a, as maybe a fourth quality. They're looking onwards. What else could – how can we reinvent what we're doing? The innovation that Mozilla, of course, in the, for two decades that she was there, but that she saw about how they're constantly reinventing themselves. This is not a new challenge for them. It's a newer challenge for the other three to, on that reinvention, which they've mastered. But that, that constantly challenging the status quo, and probably the last one, is on resilience. They all This was a body blow to all of us, uh, adversity. But instead of being stumbled or felled by it, they embraced it with enthusiasm. You could just, you, you, it, it was palpable excitement about this new normal that they're talking about, that rather than seeing any kind of a, a bereavement for what they've lost, uh, mm -hmm. it, it, this the certain kind of resilience, and not that they were welcoming this catastrophic uh, pandemic, uh, but they weren't felled by it. It's like uh, what what uh, what Nietzsche said: that what doesn't kill me makes me stronger. Uh, <laughs> well, well, having said that, you know, what do leaders need to be thinking about and doing better to be prepared for the next disruption? You know, as Rich reminded us, it's coming. I don't know what it's going to be, but it's coming. Uh, and and I put that again in context of this letter of CEOs, hundreds coming out and saying, you know, they need to be speaking about, out about some of these big social matters, whether it's inequities, wealth distribution, racism. Um, so what do we need to be, what do we need to see in our leaders to be prepared for all of this? Well, it, to that big question you've asked, there are different consequences for the internal culture of their organizations, as well as what they speak to all those disparate external constituencies. The, uh, you know, the map of a CEO's set of stakeholders is a complex one. There is a certain primacy of the sh to the shareholder. However, even Milton Friedman in that, in that um, ren renowned or infamous, depending on your point of view, New York Times Magazine ar article that he wrote back in 1971, where people have interpreted that as the only responsibility of business is the bottom line. He didn't say that quite there. He did say that there, there's a lot to do with the, the ripple effects, the societal ripple effects that are important for these people to address. And I think that for these CEOs recognizing that uh, they don't want uh, an angry society. It's not good for shareholders. It's not good mm. for work. It's not good for customers. So somehow uh, a reweaving the tapestry of America, and of course, and uh, these are global businesses, as we, sp we spoke so much about some of their businesses in, 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 in Europe, uh, where, where it was lagging a little bit, by the way, tech, uh, candidly, whereas things were, they told us were taking off more in Asia and China, especially Japan, but is that how do they reweave the tapestry of these societies so we don't get into this vilification? But the finger pointing, uh, the, the anger, uh, the, the sense of, uh, of, of uh, which side are you on, that, that doesn't work with businesses and it doesn't work for our democracy or for free enterprise or for these free yeah. markets. Is that they have to it's be, something you know, it's something Mitchell has thought about a lot in terms of how the internet can and should be better because we've seen how it can be a force of good but we've also seen how it can be a force of bad and she thinks about that a lot um, just got a few minutes left here younger executives who might be listening right now um, how should they be thinking ahead and preparing for being good leaders in challenging times is it something that you just have 
it's just something you have to learn on the job? Well, it's, uh, you know, people wonder if it's, you know, if it's made or born. Uh, and, and, and it's a combination. There are people who have natural advantages. Uh, these people, their leadership styles were, were, were different. Not only were mm -hmm. their industries different, but you could just see uh, that, that their styles were, were extraordinarily good matches. If you had to have an archetype for each in their respective sectors, I couldn't think of anybody who was more comfortable with mastering technologies for years as Mitchell did, and that as she has taken through the different Amazing. life stages of the business. Uh, but then you take a look at Mark and you can see how, how sensitive he is to the, the, to the, the travelers and knowing it's going to be a while before they get, get the business travelers back, but how are they serving the recreational travelers differently? Uh, and then, and then rich, of course, understanding the consumer entertainment experience, but also the creative developer that he was talking about. Uh, and then Joanne and, and sort of, you know, understanding how do we create that experience of shopping to deal with the online experience is finding that opportunity is that you, you might look at the four of these people and think, well, how does my character match up against them? Just not that you can't have different styles that are cross purpose with an industry, but if you had to take a look at stylistically matching them is what you would think about uh, how yeah. somebody thinks as a uh, uh, rich is very expressive, very verbal, ver very verbal. And you could see that that Mitchell was very contemplative in thinking of different stages and, uh, uh, an unbelievably great listener is is uh, Joanne and Mark. You know, was so was thinking of the ripple effect of his business on other industries. Is he so dependent in the travel business right. on the wealth of others? You can see. So when you pick your business, a young executive could think, "How do I match up against these different people?" Another uh, implication for a rising a rising executive, a new member of the wor workforce, is to take a look at how opportunity abounds in every one of these. Uh, that, that you can there's an opportunity for reinvention e in each one. However, they're at different paces and in different places. So uh, I think there's a, in terms of trying to figure out where you fit, you could take these people and you really couldn't slide them into each other's jobs. Sometimes a problem we yeah. have perhaps in business schools is we think of managers as interchangeable parts. They're not purely. These people grew up and were groomed in their industries and they could move into other roles, but they're very well suited for the roles they're in. So we should try to think about how do you build on your strengths as these people did. These people were not opportunistic job hoppers that were randomly hopping around from place to place. With younger managers, I often see people that are that that start to go through too many jobs too soon because they're almost in a manic craze that, that no job is perfect. Well, you try to make your, your job better, but also build up a track record of expertise where people can say, you actually know something and you're not looking like you're, right. you're, well, you're friends. And it's interesting, just to wrap up, because you've got to run. Uh, I know we could talk for hours with you too about leadership. I remember Mark and Hyatt saying to me in our planning call that I need those cross-functional teams, teams who can, we learned in the pandemic, be able to pivot quickly to whatever was needed. So, you know, it's, it's interesting too that they're talking about the kind of workers that they need as well um, to support their leadership teams, certainly in times of crisis. Um, Jeff, you're a dream, a go-to uh, when we want to know what's on the minds of CEOs. So really appreciate your input. Thank you so much. Be Thank well. you. Their pandemic pivots were excellent. I really enjoyed it. Thanks for including me. You bet. Take care. Take care of yourself. And we're going to have to leave it there, everyone. Thank you to all of our speakers for joining us today. We are grateful for everyone's participation and also their perspective. Really just uh, kind of hit on so many different points. Thank you, too, to our sponsor, Alex Partners, for making this briefing possible. And if you'd like more information on this topic from Alex Partners, please visit the resources tab. It's on your screen. To our audience, both within and beyond the Bloomberg community, thank you so much for joining us. You can follow the conversation with uh, at Bloomberg Live on LinkedIn, Twitter, or certainly like us on Facebook. And to learn more about other upcoming events, visit our website at BloombergLive.com. Finally, to everyone who joined us today, don't forget you can watch this again on demand. There's a lot of great information there. Thank you so much. Stay well, everyone.